You're about to be entertained by some of the biggest names in show business. For the next hour and 30 minutes, this program will present in person such bright stars as... Eddie Arnold. Eddie Cantor. Jack Carson. Olivia de Havilland. Bill Foster. Tommy Henrik. Martha Ray. Evelyn Varden. Meredith Wilson. And my name, darlings, is Tallulah Bankhead. <laughs> The National Broadcasting Company presents The Big Show. So listen, America, the curtains up, America. We're going to fill your bar full of stars. The Big Show, 90 minutes with the most scintillating personalities in the entertainment world. Brought to you this Sunday and every Sunday at this same time as the Sunday feature of NBC's All-Star Festival. And here is your hostess, the glamorous, unpredictable Tallulah Bankhead. Well, darlings, this was the week for spring cleaning. I picked a very sunny day and went to the racetrack. What a cleaning. And when I got home, I went to work on the house cleaning. I started with the medicine cabinet. Hundreds of little bottles of pills taking up all that space. So I emptied all the little bottles into one big bottle. Sleeping pills, reducing pills, appetite pills, liver pills. I didn't feel quite right the other day. So I shook the bottle up, took a pill, slept two days, lost six pounds, and woke up eating a chopped chicken liver sandwich. <laughs> One chopped chicken liver sandwich coming up. Mother Ray. Do you want mustard on that sandwich? Uh, Martha, no, I wasn't ordering. Uh, hold your mustard. I don't want a sandwich. Hold your sandwich. Martha, please, will you be quiet? Hold your tongue, girl. <laughs> That's better. What is this short order character you're doing here? Oh, didn't you know? Well, that's the way I broke into the movies. You see, when I first went out to Hollywood, I figured that somebody might discover me if I took a job as a waitress in a Hollywood restaurant. And sure enough, huh, just like in the movies, a talent scout came in one day and he says, who is that beautiful girl? So I went over and found out. <laughs> well, how did you finally get into the movies, darling? Oh, it was easy. You see, one day a director came in, took one look at me, and he put me in the pictures. A director took one look at you and recognized your talent and your ability? No, he recognized me. I'm his sister. <laughs> That's a good one, huh? Bye. Well, that was... <laughs> that was relatively easy. Tell me, darling, uh, what have you been doing lately? Now, where did you get that lovely suntan? In Miami. Really? Miami where? Miami where? <laughs> Miami, Florida, That's where. Oh, Florida, of course. You were on vacation. Well, I worked in a nightclub, but during the day I was on the beach. Oh, I wish you could have seen my bathing suit. <laughs> Nobody else could. <laughs> oh, I see. You wore one of those bikini bathing suits. Huh? Speak up, girl. Speak up. Oh, you know the bikini bathing suits. A very scanty swimsuit named after that coral reef in the Pacific, the Bikini Atoll. Well, mine was named after nothing at all. <laughs> I know what you mean. Oh, I wouldn't buy one of those bathing suits unless the label said guaranteed not to shrink. Well, that's what it said, and they were right. That was the only thing that didn't shrink, the label. <laughs> well, how did you swim in it? Barely. <laughs> Barely, that's a joke, son. <clears throat> you know, you see, um, I had a job on the beach there as a life-saving guard. Really, darling, doing what? Saving lifeguards. Saving lifeguards? You're supposed to save women and children from drowning. Well, you save who you like, and I'll save who I like. <laughs> no, but Martha, I'm more interested in your nightclub act. You see, when this show takes a summer vacation, I'll have three months before we come back in the fall. And I thought maybe that I could play that nightclub you own in Miami. Uh, Martha Ray's Five O'Clock Club, isn't it? Yes, it's the Five O'Clock Club. And thanks for the club, Tadula. Uh, not at all, darling. But Tadula, tell me, have you ever been on a nightclub floor? Too often, darling. <laughs> Till there's nothing to it. You slip the waiters a few bucks and they applaud for you. Oh, clack. 
If they don't, I'll clack them in the head. <laughs> but I don't think I'd have the nerve to get out on a nightclub floor. I'd be petrified. Well, that helps. <clears throat> <laughs> Look, Tadul, I'll speak to the man who owns the nightclub where I work. He's a nice guy, but sort of a, well, a kind of a goon. I've known him for years. He lets me use his cabana on the beach during the day. I had the sun in the morning and the goon at night. Boy, I don't want to touch out of town. <laughs> Simmer down, Buster. If you want to sing, Martha, I wish you'd sing that beautiful thing you sang on our show a few months ago. We've had loads of letters asking for it again. You mean that old black magic? That's the one, baby. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the greatest ballad singers of our time, Miss Martha Ray weaving that old black magic. Meredith, darling, how about that beautiful Sid Fan arrangement, if you please, sir? That old black magic has me in its spell. That old Black magic that I feel so well As I see fingers up and down my spine It's the same old witchcraft When your eyes meet mine The same old tingle That I feel inside And as an elevator Like a leaf that's caught in time I know I, I should stay away But what can I do? I hear your, hear your name And I'm all aflame I'm aflame with such a burning Can put out my fire for your the lover that I have waited for the mate that fate had me created for and every time your lips meet mine, baby down down high. Speed. Ooh, I'm loving this thing I'm in Under that old black magic called love That I have waited for You're the mate that fate Had me, had me created for And every time your lips Remind daddy down Head down I go All around I go In a spin Under that old black magic call <laughs> Wonderful, Martha. Wonderful, simple, divine. Oh, what I would give if I could sing like that. Give my regards to Broadway, <laughs> remember me to Herald Square. Does that sound like Martha Ray? 
Sounds more like Sugar Ray. <laughs> what do you mean by that, Jack Carson? <laughs> What's wrong with my voice, Jack? Well, I'll, I'll give it to you straight from the shoulder, Tallulah, and uh, that's where your voice sounds like it's coming from, straight from the shoulder. I can't understand it. I adore music. I listen to recordings. Tunes keep running through my mind all day long. I'm so full of music. I'm full of harmony. I'm full of melody. Mm, I know what you're full of, but... Um... <laughs> Aren't you singing, Tallulah? I, I happen to know something about putting over a song. I, I can help you. Oh, Jack, if you can, I'll put my career in your hands. Good. Well, now, first... I'll put my future as a singer in your hands. Good. Now... And now, where do we start? Yeah, with your throat. Put that in my hands, will you? <laughs> no, no. First, let's analyze Martha Ray's singing. Uh-huh. Now, she really sells it. Mm-hmm. Of course, in your case, it's going to be hard to even give away, but... <laughs> you, you have this wonderful big orchestra. Forty-seven men around you. Well, they should help your singing. With 47 men around, darling, who wants to sing? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean you have 47 fine musicians. You should take advantage of them. Heaven knows I've tried. <laughs> <laughs> I think I see what you mean. Well, let's take, um, let's take old black magic and see how you do with that. I'll do the piano, please, huh? That old black magic has me in its spell. Now try that. That old black magic has me in its spell. <laughs> <laughs> Having one of your bad spells, eh? <laughs> that old black magic that you weave so well. Come on, tell her, baby, sell it. That old black magic that you weave so well, 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 well. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like spot welding, doesn't it? <laughs> Those icy fingers up and down my spine. Take it. That same old witchcraft when your lips meet mine. Well, I don't know about the craft part, but the wit... Well, never mind. Let's take, it, let's take it down further where it goes. A flame with such a burning desire Sell it to you, baby That only kiss Can put out of the fire Well, did I sell it, honey? Sort of a fire sale. <laughs> But why, why don't you give up singing? Now, just a minute, now, Another Buster. Martha Ray you'll never be. You'll never give out like she does. You, you haven't got the large mouth she has. <laughs> oh, forget it. There must be something else you can do. Something else? Yes. Listen here, you fugitive from a Dennis Morgan picture. Huh? <laughs> you overgrown Milwaukee, Freddie Bartholomew. Oh, ho, ho. I was wrong. You have got a big mouth. <laughs> But look, kid, I, I wasn't trying to belittle you and your singing. You can't have a rate with a singer like Martha because you just haven't got the physical equipment. <laughs> it isn't as if you haven't got as much or even more, but it's just when it comes to singing... <laughs> when it comes to singing, you've got the wrong kind. Martha has a, a natural feel for singing. She really belts out a song. Why can she and why can't I? Well, she has the vocal cords for it. I'll admit she can hit high notes and I She can. has the larynx for it. Yes, I guess she's sitting pretty. She has the background for it. <laughs> well, you have quite a bit of background yourself. Why don't you go put it down somewhere while I present our next star? <laughs> and now, ladies and gentlemen, we are privileged to welcome to the big show an actress whose gifts of charm and eloquence whose powers of portrayal and interpretation have won for her place in our hearts two Academy Awards for Outstanding Performances in Pictures and most recently the plaudits of Shakespearean scholars for her triumphal revival of the immortal Juliet in Romeo and Juliet at the Broadhurst Theatre, New York. Here is Miss Olivia de Havilland. From the stage of the Broadhurst to the stage of our big show in the Center Theater, 
Mr. Olivia de Havilland in the famous chord scene from Romeo and Juliet. feeling between the great houses of Capulet and Montague in 15th century Verona, Italy, has reached a stage of explosive tension. Unknown to both families, however, Juliet, daughter of the Capulets, and Romeo, son of the Montagues, have been secretly married at noon of this very day. Juliet awaits her marriage night, does not yet know that Romeo, to avenge the killing of his friend Mercutio, has meanwhile slain her kinsman Tybalt in a duel. By the window of her tower bedroom, she awaits the coming of her nurse, who is to bring the rope ladder of cords so that Romeo can come to her. Before the nurse arrives with the tidings of tragedy, an eager Juliet speaks her soliloquy. Gallop apace, you fiery-footed steeds, toward Phoebus' lodging. Such a wagoner as Phaethon would whip you to the west and bring in cloudy night immediately. Spread thy close curtain, love-performing night, that runaway's eyes may wink and Romeo leap to these arms, untalked of and unseen. Lovers can see to do their amorous rites by their own beauty. Or if love be blind, it best agrees with night. Come, civil night, thou sober-suited matron all in black, and learn me how to lose a winning match, played for a pair of stainless maidenhoods. Hood my unmanned blood baiting in my cheeks with thy black mantle, till strange love, grown bold, think true love, acted, Simple modesty. Come, night. Come, Romeo. Come, thou day in night. For thou shalt lie upon the wings of night, whiter than you snow on a raven's back. Come, gentle night. Come, loving black-browed night. Give me my Romeo. And when he shall die, Take him and cut him out in little stars, and he shall make the face of heaven so fine that all the world will be in love with night and pay no worship to the garish sun. Oh, I have bought the mansion of a love, but not possessed it, and though I am sold, not yet enjoyed. So tedious is this day, as is the night before some festival, to an impatient child that hath new robes and may not wear them. Oh, here comes my nurse, and she brings news, and every tongue that speaks but Romeo's name speaks heavenly eloquence. Now, nurse, what news? What hast thou there, the cords that Romeo bade thee fetch? I, I, the cords. Ay, me, why dost thou wring thy hands? Oh, well a day, he's dead, he's dead, he's dead. We are undone, lady, we are undone. Alack, the day, he's gone. He's killed, he's dead. Can heaven be so envious? Romeo can, though heaven cannot. Oh, Romeo, Romeo, whoever would have thought it. Romeo! What devil art thou that dost torment me thus? This torture should be wrought in dismal hell. Hath Romeo slain himself? I saw the wound. I saw it with mine eyes. God save the mark. A piteous cause. A bloody piteous cause. Pale, pale as ashes. All bedaubed in blood, all in gore blood, I swooned it at the sight. Oh, break my heart. 
Oh, bankrupt, break at once. To prison eyes ne'er look on liberty. Vile earth to earth resign, end motion here. And thou and Romeo press one heavy beer. Oh, Tybalt, Tybalt, the best friend I had. Oh, courteous Tybalt, honest gentleman, that ever I should live to see thee dead. What storm is this that blows so contrary? Is Romeo slaughtered and is Tybalt dead? My dearest cousin and my dearer lord? Then dreadful trumpets sound the general doom, for who is living if those two are gone? Tybalt is gone and Romeo banished. Romeo that murdered him is banished. God, did Romeo's hand shed Tybalt's blood? It did, it did, alas the day it did. Oh, serpent heart. Did with a flowering face. Did ever dragon keep so fair a cave? Beautiful tyrant, fiend angelical, just opposite to what thou justly seemst. Oh, nature, what hadst thou to do in hell when thou didst bower the spirit of a fiend in mortal paradise of such sweet flesh? Oh, that deceit should dwell in such a gorgeous Palace. There's no trust, no faith, no honesty in men. All perjured, all forsworn, all not, all dissemblers. Oh, where's my man? Give me some aqua vita. These griefs, these woes, these sorrows make me old. Shame come to Romeo. Blistered be thy tongue for such a wish. He was not born to shame. Upon his brow, shame is a shame to sit, but is a throne where honor may be crowned sole monarch of the universal earth. Oh, what a beast was I to chide at him. Will you speak well of him that killed your cousin? Shall I speak ill of him that is my husband? Ah, poor my lord, what tongue shall smooth thy name when I, thy three hours' wife, have mangled it? But wherefore, villain, didst thou kill my cousin? That villain cousin would have killed my husband. Back, foolish tears, back to your native spring. My husband lives that Tybalt would have slain, and Tybalt's dead that would have slain my husband. All this is comfort. Wherefore, weep by then. Some word there was. Worser than Tybalt's death that murdered me. I would forget it fain, but oh, it presses to my memory like damned guilty deeds to sinners' minds. Tybalt is dead. And Romeo, banish it. That banish it, that one word banish it, has slain 10,000 Tybalt's. Romeo is banish it. Speak that word, his father, mother, Tybalt, Romeo, Juliet, all slain, all dead. Romeo is banished. There is no end, no limit, measure bound in that word's death. No words can that woe sound. <laughs> Where is my father and my mother, nurse? Weeping and wailing over Tybalt's course. Will you go to them? I will bring you thither. Wash they his wounds with tears. Mine shall be spent when theirs are dry for Romeo's banishment. Take thou those cords. Poor ropes, you are beguiled, both you and I, for Romeo is exiled. He made you for a highway to my bed. But I, a maid, die maiden widowed. Come, cords. Come, nurse. I'll to my wedding bed. And death, not Romeo.
take my maidenhead. Stay in your chamber. I'll find Romeo to comfort you. I wot well where he is. Hark ye. Your Romeo will be here at night. I'll to him. He is hid at Lawrence's cell. Oh, find him. Give this ring to my true knight and bid him come to take his last farewell. <laughs> Bravo, bravo, Olivia de Havilland. A magnificent performance, darling, and so ably assisted by Miss Evelyn Varden. Olivia, my dear, would you mind coming here for a moment? I must say, a more tender, a lovely Juliet I've never seen. Thank you very much, Tallulah. Except, of course, when I played it. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And now, Olivia, we are not going to have a typical petty squabble between two actresses, are we, my sweets? Well, I didn't intend to start one. But you say when you appeared in Romeo and Juliet, your performance was better than... Oh, I didn't say it was better than yours. No, no. I merely gave it a different interpretation. Compared to yours, my performance had more depth. <laughs> and more width. <laughs> oh, it's going to be that kind of a routine, huh? Well, don't blame me, Tallulah. I was on my way to the dressing room when you called me over and told me about your performance in Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> What's so funny about that? Oh, nothing. I was just trying to picture you climbing over the garden wall and looking up at the balcony at Juliet. <laughs> And not only that, but I revised the part a little. <laughs> I will admit it may have been too drastic a revision of Juliet because it uh, didn't play as I hoped. How about Romeo? He wouldn't play either. <laughs> as for criticizing you, my dear, I only saw you for the first time here. I haven't seen the play, but I'd give anything to see you in it. 480 will do it. <laughs> But I'm more interested in these revisions you say you made in the part of Juliet. What were they? Uh, well, as you know, Olivia, darling, Juliet was supposed to have been only about 14 years old, a young girl with old ideas. Oh, and you revised it to an old girl with young ideas. <laughs> Just a minute, Snake Pit. <laughs> I happen to have been 14 years old when I played it. Only 14? That's right. Despite that tender age... Maya Juliet was in the finest Shakespearean tradition. Well, of course, darling. You had the advantage of working with the author. <laughs> oh, isn't she sweet? Wilson and the Big Show Orchestra and Chorus. I'll take just a moment before we continue to say that this is NBC, the national broadcasting company. The 
Big Show. This is the national broadcasting company, Sunday Extravaganza, with the most scintillating personalities in show business. The Big Show, the Sunday night feature of NBC's All-Star Festival, is brought to you by the makers of Anacin, for fast relief from the pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. By RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. And by Chesterfield, the only cigarette that gives you mildness plus no unpleasant aftertaste. The cigarette that brings you Bing Crosby and Bob Hope. The big stars on this program are Eddie Arnold, Eddie Cantor, Jack Carson, Olivia de Havilland, Phil Foster, Tommy Henrik, Martha Ray, Meredith Wilson and his big show orchestra and chorus. And every week, your hostess, the glamorous, unpredictable... The Lula Bankhead. Well, darlings, what do you think? Last week, we received two awards on this show, and this week comes another. From Radio and Television Mirror magazine, voted the favorite newcomer to radio... I hope you won't consider this bragging, which it is. <laughs> but I just love the inscription on that Radio and Television Mirror Award, favorite newcomer. I'm intrigued with that word newcomer. It has such a youthful flavor about it. <laughs> it's been so long since I've been a newcomer to anything. <laughs> anyway, I felt so good about it that I thought I'd celebrate last week and go out to the ball game. I hailed a cab and who should drive up but Max Taxi, a gentleman who reminds me so very much of Eddie Cantor. Taxi lady. So where do you want to go, lady? Uh, take me out to the ballpark. Oh, the game between the New York Yanks and the Brooklyn Dodgers? Which team are you going to root for? Well, the Giants are my team. <laughs> Thank you, darlings. <laughs> but when they're not playing, I'm for... Uh, Heaven forgive me, the Yankees. I'm sorry, this is a Brooklyn taxi. Go get yourself a Yankee taxi. I'm not going to stand here all year waiting for another taxi. Look at her. If Brooklyn can always wait till next year, so can you. Will you let me get into this cab? I've got to get there in time for the flag raising. Oh, they don't raise the pennant flag today. That's on the opening day, Tuesday. I am not discussing the pennant flag. When I show up there, they raise the Confederate flag. Hey, taxi, you empty? Step right in, mister. Just a minute, this is my cab. Tallulah. Remember me, Jack Carson? Unfortunately, I do. <laughs> but I've already engaged this taxi. She's young. She's lovely. She's engaged to a taxi. <laughs> Will you kindly step aside, Jack? Yeah, but the driver said the cab was empty, so I'm taking no, it. No, no, you're not. Now, look, look, if you two fellows are going to fight over the cab... Now, did, didn't I offer this... <laughs> <laughs> didn't I offer this cab first? Come on, I'm in a hurry, I'm in a hurry. What's your hurry? Are you playing shortstop today? <laughs> a peewee Reese you ain't. <laughs> a peewee she ain't either. <laughs> I want to get up there in a hurry because I'm a Yankee fan. I'm going up to see them lose again. Lose again? The Yankees won the game yesterday. I am talking about the Yankees that lost the game between the states. <laughs> hey, innkeeper, coachman. Come on, let's go. Step on it, come on. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Where are you going? Take me out to the ball game. <laughs> Yo, Joe DiMaggio. How are things with Yogi Barra? <laughs> come on, step on it, let's go. Just a minute, lady. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Wait a minute. We're having a round-table discussion here about the cab. A round-table discussion with these squares? <laughs> Come on, let's go. This is my cab. I'm sorry, but the driver gave me the cab. Well, the cab is empty, and I'm taking it. Now, just a minute. Just a minute, will you? No fighting. Everything can be settled peacefully and according to law. Everybody knows that possession is nine-tenths of the law, and since the taxi is in my possession, owned in partnership with the finance company... <laughs> We'll call up the finance company, hold the board of directors meeting and decide who should get the cab. Or we can go to the one higher authority, the taxi driver's creed, okay? Okay, anything. Let's get going. Okay, the taxi driver's creed, quote, eeny, miny, eeny, meeny, miny, maxi, you're the one who gets the taxi. Okay, mister, you win. That's me. <laughs> taxi driver, let's go. Now, just a minute, Tallulah. As long as you're going up to the game, why don't you let me go with you? You in a taxi with me? 
holding hands, necking, wanting a kiss. Oh, no, I promise you on my word, I won't do it. Then who needs you? <laughs> well, who needs her? Come with me, Jack, I'll give you a lift. But you haven't got a car, Martha. Well, who needs a car? Come on, hop on. We'll go piggyback. <laughs> Bob, let's go. Okay, lady, all right. Well, Miss Bankhead, it's a pleasure for Maxie the taxi to be driving you again, huh? Oh, that's Bankhead for you. Can't pick a horse, can't pick a cab. You know why I'm driving you instead of the mother two screwballs? No, why are you driving me instead of the mother two screwballs? Because I feel we Southerners should stick together. <laughs> we Southerners? Ain't you from Alabama? Yes, and you? Southern Boulevard in the Bronx? <laughs> well, a launchman, y'all. <laughs> A launchman, you are. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I heard you on the radio last week, Miss Bankett, and you was terrific, if I may say so. You may. <laughs> you sure got a great show. Even the kids like you. Only last Sunday, my little Herman says, tune in the radio, Uncle Tallulah's on. <laughs> Uncle Tallulah, how sweet. Yeah, you ought to come up and meet the family sometime, Miss Bankhead. Anytime. You just name the year. <laughs> yeah, nothing like having a family, that's what I say. How do you like kids, Miss Bankhead? Sausage. <laughs> I even hated myself as a child. You don't like kids, huh? Oh, I have nothing against the little darlings. It's just that they're so, uh, so sticky. <laughs> oh, you'd love my little Hyman. He's one of your biggest fans. Listens to you all the time. By the way, would you mind autographing this picture for him? Why, I'd be delighted. Here you are. Just a second. Why should I sign this? It's a picture of Ava Gardner. Look, the kid's never seen you. Let him live a little. <laughs> <laughs> I gather you think I'm unattractive Oh, I wouldn't say you was homely Thank you On the other hand, you're no Humphrey Bogart <laughs> No, Miss Bankhead, I would say you're a great deal like my cab The paint ain't what it used to be, but the motor's still running Well, I've been thinking of trading myself in on a new Ford Maxie, I'm going to be late for the game Can't you hurry, darling? Oh, you show people are all alike Even when you're going someplace to relax, you're in a hurry you should take things easy, Miss Bankhead. Yes, I suppose you're right. A little rest never hurts nobody. For example, don't you feel better when you go to bed at 9.30 and drink a nice glass of warm milk? When I go to bed when and drink what? What's the matter? Don't you drink milk? I did once on a dare. I take it you don't like milk. I can't stand the stuff. It makes me violently healthy. <laughs> I'm partial to Coca-Cola with a yogurt chaser. Oh, Maxie, Maxie, can't you go any faster? It feels like we're standing still. We are standing still. I stopped for a light. Well, hurry and get away. What's the rush? The red light clashes with my dress. Besides, I don't want to miss the ball game. Relax, I'll get you there. Here, have a smoke. Oh, thanks. Got a light? Yes, I've got one. Ah, say, that's good. Should be. It's clear Havana. <laughs> I never smoked the panatella shape before. <laughs> what on earth was that? It's that sailor on the corner. He's whistling. His bank had closed the door. He's only whistling for the cab. Oh, well, I couldn't take any chances. If I was wrong, I'd never forgiven myself. Now we can go, Miss Bankhead. The light just changed. Oh, just a moment. I think you'd better throw the cigar away. Why? That sailor just saluted me. <laughs> You know something, Miss Bankhead? Gosh, you smell good. No, oh, well, that's the nicest thing anyone said to me all day. That's the same perfume you was wearing the last time I drove you. Ah, how do you know? Well, for a week, the cab smelled like a barbershop. <laughs> this happens to be imported perfume. Yeah? I bought my wife a bottle of that stuff once. It was gone the same day. How come? My brother-in-law drank it. <laughs> oh, what a guy that married it. Oh, what a guy. Here's a fella. Here's a fellow. My brother-in-law, he got hysterical when they raised the telephone rates from a nickel to a dime. It meant they had to retool and make smaller slugs. <laughs> Never had a cent to his name, you know. Doesn't he work? Work? Miss Bankhead, you are talking about an individual who is green on one side from sleeping on pool tables. <laughs> Every time he shakes hands with you, he says, excuse the chalk. But one thing I'll admit, at dinner time, he comes home and helps my wife in the kitchen. She does the cooking, he does the eating. Well, say... What are you going to do with a guy who uses a salami for a watch fob? 
Hey, that gives me an idea, Miss Bankhead. Are uh, you still single? Why? Let me put it this way. Would you like to save some money on your income tax? Naturally. Marry my brother-in-law. How will that save me money? You can deduct them as a total loss. <laughs> you two would be a good combination. He's stupid and you got money. I am not interested. Think it over, Miss Bankhead. After all, you are not getting any younger. No, but if you'll read my press notices, you'll find I'm not getting any older, either. Well, here we are at the, uh, you should excuse the expression, Yankee Stadium. Uh, what do I owe you? A dollar seventy-five. All right, there you are, a dollar seventy-five. Thank you. Now about the tip. Oh, yes, of course, the tip. Here you are. Twenty-five cents. Miss Bankhead, the last time you gave me a five-dollar tip. Yeah, but the last time I didn't know you were a Brooklyn fan. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. How do you like that? 25 cents. I could have taken Martha Ray or Jack Carson. I know what they would have tipped me. Eh, so I'm 15 cents ahead. If you'd like to know a quick, easy way to ease the pain of a headache, neuritis, or neuralgia, then by all means, try Anison. Your own dentist or physician may at one time or another have handed you an envelope containing Anison tablets. Then you already know how incredibly fast and effectively Anison brings relief. Anison is like a doctor's prescription. That is, Anison contains not just one, but a combination of medically proven active ingredients. For your own sake, try Anison. Anison is sold to you on this guarantee. If the first few tablets do not give you all the relief you want as fast as you want it, you may return the unused portion and your money will be refunded. You can get Anison tablets at any drug counter. Anison comes in handy boxes of 12 and 30 tablets and economical family sized bottles of 50 and 100. <laughs> Well, darlings, while I was out at the ballpark finishing my 12th hot dog and my 15th soft drink, <laughs> who's been tampering with my scripts? <laughs> well, who do you think? Who should come up to the left field box where I was sitting and say... How do you do, Miss Bankhead? But old reliable himself, Tommy Henry. <laughs> well, Tommy... I've been looking for you to come up to bat. Where have you been? Oh, I'm coaching this year, Miss Bankhead. You know, in this business, by the time you get to be 35, you're all through playing. And not me, darling. <laughs> <laughs> when I was 35... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when I get to be 35, I'm going to retire, too. You mean you're going to stop playing, too? Oh, no, I mean uh, retire from the theater. I'm going to keep on playing. <laughs> Well, in your business, I guess you can. But towards the end of last season, I was having trouble getting to first base. I've been having that trouble for years, though. <laughs> when I did get on third base and somebody would hit a long high ball, I'd have trouble getting home. Me too. One long high ball and I have trouble getting home. <laughs> hey, Tallulah, introduce me. Go away. Tell me, Tommy. Oh, come on. Don't be a hog. Come on. Introduce me. Hey, who's the creep? <laughs> ah. This creep just happens to be Tommy Henrik. I mean, this is Tommy Henrik. This is Tommy Henrik? Get out of here. This crumb? Are you kidding? Tommy Henrik? What do you got, bats in your dugout? Tommy Henrik. <laughs> Tommy Henrik. Hey, who's Tommy Henrik? <laughs> no, do you mean to say you've never heard of Old Reliable? Oh, I know who you are, but who's Tommy Henrik? <laughs> Tommy Henry just happens to be one of the greatest all-time Yankee ball players. He's been with them since 1937. Oh, ball player. Hey, you know, I don't understand baseball, Tommy. Maybe you can wise me up on the game. What would you like to know, Miss Creep? <laughs> that isn't he sweet? <laughs> Tell me about baseball. Well, to start with... Cut, is, that's uh... enough about baseball. Let's talk about us, old boy. <laughs> Now, Martha, if you want to learn about baseball, there's nobody who can tell you more about it than Tommy Henry. Go ahead, Tommy. Well, first, I guess you have to know that there are nine men and four bags. You mean that men and women play together? <laughs> no, no, just... Just come on, Tommy. Just 
Tommy, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Just nine ball players to a team. Haven't you ever seen a ball game? Oh, sure. You know, my favorite ball player is, um, he's, uh, oh, uh, what's his name? Oh, you know, the one that looks like Joe DiMaggio. Looks like Joe DiMaggio? Yeah. Well, I remember seeing in the paper one day, Joe DiMaggio's double wins game. <laughs> <laughs> Jess, you mind if I cut in here? Oh, Jack, this is Tommy Henrik. This creep is Tommy Henrik? <laughs> Not me, you dope. I'm Martha Ray. Huh? Oh. Well, hello, Tommy. Glad to see you. Glad to know you, Jack. You know, I was once in baseball. Yeah? What position did you play? I was in left field. Oh, an outfielder. No, no, I sold hot dogs. <laughs> <laughs> One day, an awful thing happened. I dropped a whole tray of hot dogs in the left field stands. Oh, that's terrible. What did you do, Jack? It didn't take me long to clean it, but I had to go all the way around to right field to sell them. <laughs> Tommy, this is something I happen to know about you. You're quite a singer, aren't you? Oh, I don't know. During the winter, I sing some barbershop quartet numbers. Well, how about singing something for us? Well, I can't do much without the other three fellas. Oh, what a flimsy excuse. I sing. I don't need any excuse like that. I've heard you sing, Miss Bankhead. There is no excuse. <laughs> Three other fellas, indeed. I'm a whole quartet by myself. Listen to this, darlings, in spite of my code. <laughs> I sing a little tenor, sing a little baritone. Also sing a little bass I have a most peculiar voice Full of charm and grace You can have your pericomo, your sonata and your ping But they can't take my place I sing a little tenor Sing a little baritone Also sing a little You'll never make it, Miss Bankhead You wanna bet? Step aside, Buster, I may spray Here's a word from RCA Victor. Inch for inch, your best buy in television is RCA Victor 19-inch. It's big, better, more for your money. And here's why. RCA Victor's new picture pickup brings in the best possible reception. Pictures are clear, steady, and bright. And RCA Victor television is million-proof television, quality proven in over two million homes. Best of all, RCA Victor 19-inch television is yours for little more than what was once paid for 10-inch television. And remember this, only RCA Victor owners can buy the RCA Victor factory service contract for expert installation and maintenance. So ask your RCA Victor dealer to show you 19-inch television. It's available in a wide range of table models, consoles, and combination instruments. And by the way, here's a big RCA Victor record value. It's the new Singer's Single Series. 54 all-time Tin Pan Alley tunes by nine of America's brightest recording stars. And speaking of RCA, here is one of their biggest recording stars, the guitar-playing, sweet-singing, Tennessee Plowboy, Eddie Arnold. How you, Tallulah, honey? Well, I'm fine, Eddie, baby. Nice to see you. How you been, Lammy Pie? Oh, I'm fair to Midland. I'm having a little trouble there myself. <laughs> well, how's everything down home? How's the mint crop on your farm? Oh, we got a big crop of mint this year, about uh, ten glasses full. Oh, that's slim pickings. What have you been doing since you came up north, Eddie boy? Spine. <laughs> well, good for you. Where are you stopping in town, Eddie? The Dixie Hotel. 
Well, naturally. Seen any shows? Well, I saw the Tennessee Williams play. Well, naturally. In uh, South Pacific? Well, naturally. Uh, Mr. Roberts, E. Lee. <laughs> A lovely play if I ever saw one. And have you taken any of the sights while you've been up here? Yes, I took in a few of them. There's one sight you gotta take in, Eddie. Mm -hmm. Every seller who comes up here rushes right out there the first thing to enjoy this sight. Which one is that, Tallulah? Grant's tomb. <laughs> Eddie, honey, we better stop talking like this. We're in enemy territory. <laughs> How about you singing that newest RCA Victor recording of yours, Kentucky Walls? Well, I'm aiming to. Well, aim ahead, honey child. Meredith, how about some music for Eddie Arnold, if you please? We were waltzing that night in Kentucky By that beautiful harvest moon and I was a boy that was lucky But it all ended too soon As I sit here alone in the moonlight I see a smiling And I long once more for your embrace And that beautiful Kentucky walls We were walls in that night in Kentucky by that beautiful harvest moon and I was a boy that was lucky but it all ended too soon as I sit here alone in the moonlight, I see a smiling face, and I long once more for your embrace and that beautiful Kentucky. Here are two northern gentlemen who have something to say about some of the finest tobacco in the South, Bing Crosby and Bob Hope. Now here's Chesterfield's answer to Cyrano de Bergerac, Bob Hope. I'd top you easy, Dad, but we only have a minute here to sell Chesterfield. Okay, well, let's get to it. Better tasting Chesterfield is the only cigarette that combines for you mildness with no unpleasant aftertaste. Mm, the mildness is a cinch to prove. You just make the Chesterfield mildness test. You know, open a pack and enjoy that milder aroma. Then smoke them... And you'll know that Chesterfields are mild. And Chesterfield leaves no unpleasant aftertaste. That fact has been confirmed by the country's first and only cigarette taste panel. So make our cigarette your cigarette. The reasons go together like this. By Chesterfield, Chesterfield, the one that proves its case. Yes, Chesterfields are milder, milder, plus no aftertaste. So ho, open a pack and give them a sniff. Then you'll smoke them. Well, darlings, we have more show for you, but that'll be in just a minute after Ed Hurley, he says. This portion of the program has been brought to you by the makers of Anacin for fast relief from the pain of headache, neuritis, and neuralgia. 
by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television, and by Chesterfield, the only cigarette that gives you mildness plus no unpleasant aftertaste, the best cigarette for you to smoke. And now, Tallulah Blossom, honey, if you want to ring your ever-loving chime. I sure do, eh? This year, darlings, is NBC, the national broadcasting company. <laughs> This is the big show, and Tallulah Bankhead is about to introduce her next guest. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, at this time... Oh, Tallulah, if you don't mind, I'd like to introduce this fellow. He's from Brooklyn, and I want you to meet him for more reasons than one, if you know what I mean, Miss Bankhead. Of course, Judy. I mean, Eddie. <laughs> See, this fellow's a very good catch. They've been trying to catch him for years. Miss Bankhead... May I present a young man who has become generally recognized in the nightclub and variety world as Brooklyn's ambassador to the United States, Phil Foster. Well, Phil, what do you think of her? For this, you brought me all the way to New York. You know, I don't like to leave Brooklyn unless there's a special purpose. I got a tie on and a jacket for what? For what? I want you to meet this girl. Go on. Since when does a girl wear a Buster Brown haircut? <laughs> Boy, what some guys would do to get out of the army. <laughs> Just a minute, you. My name is Tallulah Bankhead. Tallulah? What kind of name is that? I never heard of such a name. Come on, what's your real name? Tessie? <laughs> Tessie! Phil, please, that's no way to talk. Come on, the deal's off. Give me back my broker's fee. Uh, how, how can I say to the fellas in the corner, I want you to meet my friend Tallulah. Tallulah? They, they, they run me out of the neighborhood. And what my grandmother call her? How about Tallulah? Tallulah? <laughs> I knew I'd mispronounce it. <laughs> they won't call you that in my neighborhood. Besides, in my neighborhood, there's something... Bigger and more important than girls right now. And I'm talking about the Brooklyn Dodgers. You see, you're looking at a real Brooklyn Dodger fan. And I want you to know right now, people, if you ever get a chance to see a game at Ebbets Field, don't miss the opportunity. What a game. Believe me, what a game. Sometimes the ball game starts and interferes with it. <laughs> now, you know, all ball games in Brooklyn start at 1.30. The game starts at 1.30, half past 7 in the morning, you'll find this fella standing in line. Something like this. 7.30 in the morning. He wouldn't wait on line this long for a job. <laughs> 11 o'clock, he yells to somebody. Open the gates! You creeps! I'm sweating! My sandwiches are spoiling! Amen! Finally, open the gates. After waiting in line so long, you figure this guy would run to the front row front seat, wouldn't you? Not this fella. His favorite seat happens to be in the 15th row behind a pole. <laughs> He don't like baseball. <laughs> About one o'clock, somebody in a subtle Brooklyn voice will suggest that the ball game is about to begin. Something like, Here comes the Brooks. Who's <laughs> bitch? This ball said, let me look. I can see 20, 20. 20 inches from one eye, 20 inches from the other eye. <laughs> it's Hatton. Hatton. What are you doing? Throwing a game. This fella says, let him pitch. This fella says, I don't want it. This fella says, let him pitch. And I told you, I don't want it, all right? I don't want it. Get me out, let him pitch. Okay. You know, it wasn't for that fella said, okay, Hat would never pitch a ball game. <laughs> then the guy said, now bet you half a buck the first ball Joe throws is a strike. Put up or shut up. Put your money where your mouth is. I bet you have a fuck against your glasses and send you home blind. <laughs> He's throwing the ball, the bets off. Strike one. Once, let me do it. This goes on until about the ninth inning when the Brooklyn's are leading two to one. Possible. <laughs> so the fellow in the center field bleachers begins to talk to Hatton, the pitcher, to hold the lead. Hatton is only 10 miles away. But he's gonna hear this boy. This boy's talking pretty loud. He sounds something like, Pitch them, Joe! I'm with you! I'm with you, hat baby! I'm with you! Oh, what? Dummy the team, Joe! I'm with you, baby boy! You can do it!
Compre! Morito! Go for Trail of the Giant! Right now, it's not my intention to talk to you people that live in Brooklyn or have been to Brooklyn. It's my intention to talk to you people having any intention ever going to Brooklyn. You see, we people from Brooklyn realize that whatever you want from life, you can find any block in Brooklyn. It's like a little nation in itself. What are you looking for? Candy store, drugstore, butcher, baker, doctor, whatever you want, and any block in Brooklyn. Now, with this in mind, also in any block in Brooklyn is a thing called a book. This is not to be mistaken with the book of the month. <laughs> this is the book of the block. My block, the book's name is Fat Melvin. He's a fellow takes 30 cent bets, 40 cent bets. If he gets a down the quarter bet, he lays it off on the next block. <laughs> One day there's a tremendous rain, the kind of a rain that wipes out ball games. Now, if you know fellas that hang around corners, you know what, they like to bet on things. Bet on anything, as long as it's a mind bet. There's always one fellow who'll say, I bet you a million. This is not so bad. There's always a guy next to him who says, I'll take half the bet. <laughs> so one day there's a tremendous rain. Can't go to bed on anything. Up to go to the movie. Got to go to a movie when it's raining. You ever see where fellas go to a movie when it's raining? Up go to collars. They hide along the wall. And every so often they push it out in the rain just to see if it's raining. <laughs> when they get to the theater, they always say to one fellow, lay it out. The guy that gets caught, buys a ticket, walks inside, he says to one fella, you owe me 45 cents. The fella says, I'll pay you. I'll pay you. The guy says, pay me now, I want to watch the picture. <laughs> he says, I'll pay you, what do you want me to do, break a bill? <laughs> now they sit and watch the picture. One ends at about the start of a Western picture. So Fat Melvin turns around to the seven fellas and says, look, man, I don't like to watch a picture unless I got a little action on it. The guy said, what are you talking about? He said, well, how many guys you figure ought to get killed in this picture? The guy says, 15. He says, you got to bet. <laughs> Not a happy, they're betting on a picture. One guy gets killed, two, four, five. All of a sudden, they shoot an Indian and he falls off the wrong side of the mountain. Now we have a little trouble. The seven fellas say the Indian is dead. Fat Melvin says he's hanging by a tree on the other side of the mountain. <laughs> Can't see him, what an argument. Finally decide if at the end of the picture you need his death to prove it one way or another, they'll all go behind the screen, they'll see if he's hanging. <laughs> this goes on until 13 men are dead, one minute left to go to the end of the picture and things are very exciting because the hero's best friend is a fellow by the name of Killer. He's got two villains lined up against the wall. He says, I reckon I'm going to let you have it, boys. Wipe you out, kill you, get you off the face of the earth. Now, Fat Melvin figures out very quickly, 13 plus 2, he loses. He pays off. So from the seat, he begins to talk to the picture. <laughs> Something like, uh, what do you want to kill him for? So all you got to do is kill people. <laughs> you got to kill him. Kill him in another picture. <laughs> the seven guys are yelling, die! Miserable <laughs> dogs, die! says, come on, don't be so bloodthirsty. Bang, bang, two shots ring out. The book can't look. <laughs> what happened? One fellow says, one guy is dead, the other one's wounded. Fourteen and a half. <laughs> Pat Melvin keeps talking to the picture. Kid, live. <laughs> live, kid, you're too young to die. <laughs> I don't care about the money. <laughs> I don't care about the money. Live! <laughs> I'll kill him if you don't live. <laughs> and he dies. As he dies, Pat Melvin turns around and says, how do you like that? For a miserable $8, they threw the picture. <laughs> that was just hilarious, Phil Foster. You must drop in again sometime, darling. And now, how about a little music? Meredith Wilson has an exciting arrangement of a famous spiritual, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. So here are Meredith Wilson's big show orchestra and chorus to present it. Hallelujah, sing hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah.
That was simply divine, darling. Come here, Meredith. Yes, Miss Bankhead. Uh, and now, without getting into too long a discussion with you, <laughs> Meredith, I just want to say that your orchestra and chorus number this week was simply thrilling, inspiring, beautifully done. Would you like for me to play it again? Over my dead body. <laughs> well, that's a date. Now, uh... Wherever I am when it happens, I'll come and play it over you. I'll make a note of that. And don't bother, darling. Oh, it'll be my pleasure, Miss Bankhead. Uh, don't be so happy. I'm not going till I'm good and ready. <laughs> oh, Cholula. I'm not ready, Eddie. <laughs> what are you talking about going, not going? You're too young to be talking like that. Oh, thank you, darling. That's the sweetest thing that's been said on this program for weeks. Now, you say something about me, something young. How about Loretta? <laughs> oh, I, oh, Loretta, yeah, oh, yes, yes. See how young I look? Yes, I guess you're right. A man is as old as he looks. Yes, and a woman is as old as she likes, huh? Hello, Mother. Hello, Dad. Can I go to the circus tonight? Can I, huh? Can I please, uh, please, Dad, please, Mother, huh? The circus, please? Can I go, please? Get off my lap. <laughs> Tallulah, stop talking to him like that. I finally got a son, and you're going to make him neurotic? Come here, baby, come here. <laughs> yes, Daddy. See? Daddy likes me. Ah, for you, Mommy. Isn't this nauseating? <laughs> 
<laughs> My son, the first thing you got to do is to learn to sing with your old daddy. We'll make records. See, you bring a little money into the house. And we'll split half and half. Did you take arithmetic yet? No, Daddy. We'll split half and half, 90 for me and 10 for you. Now, here, here's a beautiful song. It's called When You and I Were Young Maggie Blues. Come on, Gary. I mean, Jack. <laughs> Wait. Wait a minute. There's something not kosher here. What, what, what's that? You're hogging the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> Simply I want a favorite day Then you flavor it the hill With just a note or two oh, of Maggie I'm a need To watch the scene below And then you jazz a little I'm a legato The cream now the Maggie and the cream Is a ragged old mill You know, attention to the music Maggie That they play, but just run Used to love the way On the spot, start to sway Getting hot now The cream the grave is gone from the hills, Maggie, where once the daisies sprung. But I love you the same as of old, Maggie, when you and I were Eddie Arnold, huh? Well, well. Well, yeah. I think we ought to repeat the last eight bars, don't you? Do you, Edward? Well, what do you think we ought to pick it up, Edward, boy? Uh, from the green grave, huh? That's a pleasant thought. <laughs> the green Here the grave the is gone Where the from the rhyme. hill All around I see a harmony Maggie, where one ever loved a day is But I love now you, know you the, the same as a bowl And when you listen Just press me When you want I And I done, boys. And now let me get in here and do a little something. Yeah, I was wondering about that, Tallulah. About what, Martha? Well, I, I was wondering about what you do on this program. You know, all I've noticed so far is Divine, Meredith, very well done, boys. <laughs> Hilarious, Phil. Where are you all stopping while you're in town, Ada Hunter? <laughs> Darling, over my dead body. Step aside, Buster. I see a little tenor. I see a little panto. <laughs> I isn't she sweet? <laughs> uh, well done, darling. You have the makings of another Tallulah Bank hit. Uh, do you think the world is ready for two Tallulah Bank hits? <laughs> That's what I keep telling her. <laughs> well, what I started to say, Tallulah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, what I started to say, Tallulah, before I stepped on your lap, <clears throat> is that it's a surprise to me to see a big shot limit, legitimate actress like you doing a bit here on radio. After all, I, I always think of you as a, well, as a heck of a great actress. Why, Martha, darling, I'm deeply touched. I actually believe you really mean that. You do? <laughs> and I must be a heck of a great actress, too. <laughs> I'll figure that out later. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm going to do something here that no other actress has ever done, I believe. I'm going to read that classic poem dedicated to our national sport, which opens its season this week. A poem by Ernest Thayer, Casey at the Bat. This poem was immortalized by the late the Wolf Hopper, and I would like to try and give you my impression of his interpretation. <laughs> The outlook wasn't brilliant for the Mudville Nine that day. 
The score stood four to two with but one inning more to play. And then when Cooney died at first and Barrows did the same, a sickly silence fell upon the patrons of the game. A struggling few got up to go in deep despair. The rest clung to the hope which springs eternal in the human breast. They thought if only Casey could but get a whack at that. We'd put even money now with Casey at the bat. But Flynn preceded Casey, as did also Jimmy Blake. And the former was a no good, and the latter was a fake. So upon that stricken multitude, grim melancholy set. For there seemed but little chance of Casey getting to the bat. But Flynn let drive a single to the wonderment of all. And Blake, the most despised, tore the cover off the ball. And when the dust had risen and the men saw what had occurred, there was Blake safe at second and Flynn a hug in third. Then from 5,000 throats who went up a lusty yell, it rumbled through the valley, it rattled in the dell. It knocked upon the mountain top and recoiled upon the flat. For Casey, mighty Casey, was advancing to the bat. There was pride in Casey's bearing as he stepped into his place. There was ease in Casey's manner and a smile on Casey's face. And then responding to the cheers, he lightly doffed his hat. No stranger in the crowd could doubt. T'was Casey at the bat. Ten thousand eyes were on him as he rubbed his hands with dirt. Ten thousand hands applauded as he wiped them on his shirt. And then while the writhing pitcher ground the ball into his hip, defiance gleamed in Casey's eyes. A sneer curled Casey's lip. And now the leather-covered sphere came hurling through the air, and Casey stood out watching it in lofty grandeur there. Close by the sturdy batsman, the ball unheeded sped. That ain't my style, said Casey. Steve Rag won! <laughs> the Empire said, um, <laughs> From the benches, black with purple, there went up a muffled roar like the beating of a storm waves on a stern and distant shore. Kill him! Kill the umpire! Cried someone in the stand. And it's likely they'd have killed him had not Casey raised his hand. With a smile of Christian charity, great Casey's visage shone. He stilled the rising tumult. He made the game go on. He signaled to the pitcher. Once more, the spheroid flew. But Casey still ignored it. And the umpire said, Sirig too! <laughs> fraud! cried the maddened thousands. And Echo answered, fraud! But one scornful look from Casey and the multitude was awed. They saw his face grow stern and cold. They saw his muscles train. And they knew that Casey wouldn't let that ball go by again. The smile is gone from Casey's lips. His teeth are clenched in hate. He pounds with cruel violence his bat upon the plate. And now the pitcher holds the ball, and now he lets it go. And now the air is shattered by the force of Casey's blow. Oh, somewhere in this favored land, the sun is shining bright. Somewhere bands are playing, somewhere hearts are light. Somewhere men are laughing. 
Somewhere children shout, but there is no joy in Mudville. Mighty Casey had struck out. Divine, Tallulah? Simply divine, my dear. Well, thank you, Jack, darling. But haven't you ever wondered what happened to good old Casey when he got home after the game? Well, as a matter of fact, Jack, no, I never did. Well, uh, now let me show you. See, Martha Ray and I have been worrying about that. We figured that after the game, Casey got home and was comforted by his darling wife. Something like this. <laughs> Casey, what happened? <laughs> come on, come on, that's all I want to know. What happened? Two guys on base and you standing there with your bat on your shoulder, letting all the good ones go by. I want to know what happened. I don't know. <laughs> I simply do not know. <laughs> Honest to Tommy Henrik, I simply do not know. It was just, just one of those things I, I was... Ah, uh, shut up, you bum. <laughs> Don't you know I got old neighbors here watching me on television? And you strike out. Why, you blind bats. You... Now, just one minute. You can call me anything you like, but don't you call my little old bat blind. <laughs> it's a Louisville slugger. So there. So what happened? I don't know. I simply do not know. <laughs> Something within me snapped. Well, I keep telling you you're wearing them too tight. <laughs> well, I know I am. And it's all on account of television. That plunging neckline sweatshirt you make me wear. It was bad enough before with all those people in the stands staring at me. But now with everybody staring at me on television. Well. <laughs> After this, when I go to bed, I'm only gonna let them televise my hands. Oh. I wanna know what <laughs> I don't know. I simply don't know. Something must have got in my eye. Yeah, yeah. That girl in the box with the dirty blonde hair. <gasps> what dirty blonde girl? I never noticed any girl in any game. It was just when that dirty blonde ball came over, it had too much cur... I mean, the ball. That's it. Ah, shut up and answer the phone. Hello? Hello, Casey. This is Tallulah, darling. In the right field box, remember? Uh, uh... Hey, 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 who's that on the phone, Casey? Not that blonde dame in the box. Yeah, well, it's, uh... Oh, no! No, no, it's, it's, it's the coach, Martha. <laughs> <laughs> well, coach, what's going on? Aren't you meeting me tonight, darling? Did you get my signal? Signal? Oh, oh, yes, yes, your signal. I flashed my mirror at you. I'm sorry the sun got in your eye and made you strike out. Oh, darling. that's all right. Well, honey, where are you going to meet me tonight? Hmm? Oh, yeah, yes, coach. I'll, uh... I'll meet you in the locker room. <laughs> locker room? How cozy, darling. <laughs> huh? You want me to come over so, for some practice? Hey, well, if you feel you need it, what time? <laughs> <laughs> okay, nine o'clock tonight for practice, huh? Practice at night? Yeah. Well, yes, Martha, this is practice for night games. <laughs> night games? Now, just a minute. That don't sound like no coach to me. Give me that phone. I'll bet it's that dirty blonde. Hello, you. Hey, you stay away from my man, you hear? Or I'll bat your brains out. I beg your pardon? Hey, well, what do you know? It is the coach. <laughs> mm. 
We hope you'll be with us next Sunday when we'll have with us Fred Allen, Joan Davis, Portland Hoffer, Judy Holliday, Liza Kirk, Herb Schreiner, Fran Warren and others, and of course our very own Meredith Wilson and the Big Show Orchestra and Chorus. Until then, may the good Lord bless and keep you, whether near or far away. Martha. May you find that long-awaited golden day today, Meredith. May your troubles all be small ones and your fortune ten times ten, Olivia. May the good Lord bless and keep you till we meet again. Jack? May you walk with sunlight shining and the bluebird in every tree. Eddie? May there be a silver lining back of every cloud you see. Phil? Fill your dreams with sweet tomorrow. Never mind what might have been. Tommy Hendrick? May the good Lord bless and keep you till we meet again. Eddie Arnold? May you long recall each rainbow, then you'll soon forget all the rain. May the warm and tender memories be the ones that will remain. Fill your dreams with sweet tomorrows, never mind what might have been. May the good Lord bless and keep you until we meet again. darlings, and God speed to our armed forces all over the world who hear these broadcasts each week. The Big Show is produced and directed by D. Engelbach and written by Goodman Ace, Selma Diamond, George Foster, Mort Green, and Frank Wilson. This is Ed Hurley, he speaking. $64 question later. Right now, it's Phil Harris on NBC. NBC.